morning, everybody. Hello to everybody in the sanctuary. Hello to everyone on Zoom. Hello to everyone watching the YouTube. Let us begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to have a short video as a call to worship. Living God in this building, used to the sound of singing, where there have been baptisms and funerals, where people have come to be married or celebrate the birth of a child, in this building, in this place, where some have wept and some have been filled with joy, where people have struggled with the deep things of life, prayed urgently, been stirred and changed, in this building, where you have so often been, with your people throughout the years. Dear Lord, please be with us now with your glorious presence. Amen. Amen. We have a short video uh, outlining some words from Psalm 145. stand and sing everyone needs compassion otherwise known as mighty to save please stand Thank you. 
come to you, bringing you our worship and praise, because you are great and greatly to be praised. You are the one who is the Holy One of Israel, the Lord God Almighty, the one who was and is and is to come. You are the God who created the world and everything in it, and you created us, dear Lord, and we bring you and worship you, we bring you praise now. Dear Lord, we thank you for the story of your people throughout history, for the story of the church in 2,000 years, for the story of Israel before that. We thank you, Lord, that our faith is grounded and rooted in history because you are the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. You are the God who led your people out of Egypt with a strong hand and mighty arm. You are the God who gave your people the promised land, gave them your law. You gave them judges and kings, priests and prophets. And you ultimately sent uh, the Messiah, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, we worship you because you are the Saviour. You are the healer, you are the baptizer, and you are the coming King. And you have come into our lives by your Spirit. And you have saved us. And you are sanctifying us. And one day we will be glorified with you in heaven. We thank you that you poured out upon those first disciples in the upper room the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life. The one who is known as the third person of the Trinity. Counselor and Comforter. Holy Spirit, we worship you and we pray for your help, your blessing upon our lives in these days in which we live and upon our church service this morning. Lord, that you might uh, come to us afresh, that the fire might fall and burn up impurities, that the wind might blow, blow away the spiritual cobwebs of apathy, that, Lord, you might descend upon us with your anointing and grant to us your healing and your power gentle dove of heaven that you might descend and speak to each one of us as we have need we thank you O oh god almighty for our savior the lord jesus for his life on uh, coming to earth that we celebrate at christmas for his death and resurrection that we will be celebrating at easter and for his ascension into heaven and that he ever lives to intercede and pray for us we thank you lord for your gracious help for your gift to us of Jesus our Saviour, for your gift of the Holy Spirit, for your uh, sending to us uh, and preserving us uh, uh, for us your written word, the Bible, and for one another, the, the church, the communion of saints. And so today, this morning, grant your blessing we ask, meet with each one of us, speak to us through your word, hear our worship and our prayers, accept them according to your gracious covenant whereby you have called us to yourself and be blessed and glorified in everything that is done here today we pray similarly that those on the zoom and through the youtube might be so touched and have a sense of your presence and for brothers and sisters who are unable to join with us today who may be unwell or at work we pray that you'll bless them wherever they are just now we bring these prayers to you dear lord in and through the name of our saviour the lord jesus who is our redeemer Amen. <coughs> now I've got a video for the children, and as I often say, it's for the children and it's for everyone else. Um, but it is particularly for the children, because we're looking at the story of the lost sheep. Have you ever lost anything? Yeah, yeah? I bet loads of people have lost stuff, haven't they, here? I'm always losing my keys. Caroline and I are always losing, well, I bet, no, she's, no, that's right. Um, I'm always losing my phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going to pay for this later. Um, I'm always using my phone, my keys. This is about a story about a shepherd who's lost his sheep. Uh, one sheep out of a uh, hundred. Because God cares, did you know that? God cares about each one of us. And we are all to have a shepherd's heart for each other. So let us watch this video together. And then we're going to sing a children's song. Hello everyone, it's Anfernita. Today's story is called Lost and Found. 
The memory verse is from Matthew chapter 18, verse 14. It says, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. The message is Jesus comes looking for me when I am far from him. Seven-year-old Carla was with her mother at the market. She wandered away to watch a man showing how a toy plane worked. When she looked around, her mother was nowhere in sight. Carla was afraid. She was lost and she didn't know what to do. A long time ago, a little lamb was lost. Let's read about it. Broken bits of bushes stuck to the wool of the tired sheep as they moved along the path. The shepherd gently guided his flock of 100 sheep. The scraping sounds of their hooves on the rocks mixed with the bleating of the young ones. It was music to the shepherd's ears. Come back over this way, he coaxed, smiling at a playful lamb. The sheepfold was in sight now. Like most of the sheepfolds in the area, the shepherd had made it secure. He had piled many rocks on top of each other. Then he placed thorn bushes along the outside of the rocks. Finally, the shepherd and the sheep reached the sheepfold gate. As each one went into the sheepfold, he checked it carefully for cuts or bruises. He ran his strong but gentle hands over every sheep. The shepherd spoke soothing words and poured medicine on sore places. The impatient animals bumped against one another, eager to get in to rest. Tired and hungry, the shepherd would be glad to reach home as well. 94, 95, 96, the shepherd counted. Every morning he took his sheep to pasture and every evening he counted them as he brought them home. 97, 98, 99, he kept counting. 99, what? thought the shepherd. I am so tired tonight that I didn't count correctly. Slowly he counted again. A frown crossed his face. 97, 98, 99. His eyes checked every ewe, every ram and lamb. Oh no, where was the little lamb the shepherd had been calling back to the flock? It was just a short time ago. Now it was nowhere in sight. That one sheep could be anywhere. Carefully, the shepherd latched the gate to the sheepfold. He turned back the way he had just come despite the rising storm. He called out to his missing sheep. I really have to listen, he thought. With the wind blowing like this, it will be hard to hear, especially if my lamb is hurt. The shepherd called, then he listened. Then he called again. Carefully, the shepherd worked his way in the dark back over the rough ground. Where are you, little one? He thought. The stinging rain began to make the rocks slippery. The wild wind howled. How could the small lamb have strayed so far in such a short time? Straining once more to hear anything, he paused. Yes, he shouted into the storm. Yes, I found you. There it was, just over there, beside some rocks. The lamb lay in a crumpled heap, tangled in thorns and bleeding. Okay, okay, you'll be fine. The shepherd's gentle words calmed the frightened lamb. He untangled the thorns and scooped the lamb up into his arms. <coughs> I'm so glad I found you, he whispered. Let's go home. The rugged shepherd hiked back over the slick trail again, but this time he smiled. This time he was holding his rescued one close. Bursting into the house, the shepherd gently laid the sheep down. He cried joyfully, I have found my lost sheep. He was so happy. 
He wanted to share the good news with all his friends. When we wander far from Jesus, he comes looking for us too. We are his sheep. He loves us so much, and he is very happy when all his sheep are safe at home again. This one. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand again and sing to God. One more step along the world I go. I'm speaking to the elders among you. I was a witness of Christ's suffering, and I will also share in the glory that is to come. I'm making my appeal to you as one with an elder, together with you. Be shepherds of God's flock, the believers under your care. Watch over them, Though not because you have to, instead do it because you want to. That's what God wants you to do. Don't do it because you want to get money in his honest ways. Do it because you really want to serve. Don't act as if you were a ruler over those under your care. 
instead be examples to the flock. The chief shepherd will come again. Then you will receive the crown of glory. It is a crown that will never fade away. Thank you, Jill. We'll be looking at that passage a little bit later on. Now Brian is better, praise God, Brian and Margaret are better, and Brian's going to come and give the notices. We do want to issue a very warm welcome for anyone who would like prayer to come down to the front of the chairs here after the service and someone will be very happy to come and pray with you. Now, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here, but I think you all enjoy a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Yes. yes. Right. Now, I think you also realise that someone had to prepare that tea and that coffee in the kitchen over there. Now, it would be helpful if some more people could offer to help in the preparation of teas and coffees. If you can do that, there is a, a, a roadshop on the wall next to the gents' toilet there, uh, and if you can find a date or dates, that you could help with the teas, and would you sign up there, please? And the more people that do it, the less time you have to do it. That's a secret, you see. So if you can help with that, that would be very much appreciated. And also, we are having uh, our next Monday room meeting this coming Wednesday afternoon at 2.30. <clears throat> we were hoping and planning for uh, Sue Bertrand to come and talk about wellbeing. But because her work practice has changed considerably, um, she won't be able to make it. Uh, she hopes to come later on in the year, but for the moment she can't. So, as it was quite short notice, we will be having a games afternoon. I'll let you into another secret. If you'd have come to find a room last month we had games, it was quite raucous, there was a lot of laughter. I don't know what games I were playing, but everyone seemed to be enjoying themselves. So, if you are free this coming Wednesday at 2 30, then please come and join us there. Uh, and also, there'll be refreshments and time of fellowship together. Now, you know, it's never too early to start praying. And we will be having our, I hope to have a Holy Bible Club on the 26th to the 28th of July. Now I know that that seems months and months away, but I'm asking the fellowship now that we might start praying for that. Uh, praying that uh, we might contact children that will come. Pray that you might consider whether you might have the time off to come and help in that club. But I just ask that you might think of that in your prayers. Pray for our, our Collie Club from the 26th to the 28th of July. And then just one other little plea I'd like to make. For those who are locking up and turning off the gas heaters, please don't turn the pilot lights off. It makes it so much more difficult. When you turn it off, just leave the, uh, the sign to the star. Things like that, that would be much helpful too. And then lastly, <coughs> Margaret and I would like to express our thanks to the fellowship for all your love, your support, for your phone calls, messages on WhatsApp, visits, <coughs> things like that. We thank you for so much. We've appreciated all the support we've had while we've been coming from COVID. So I think we see now how the fellowship works in practice. So thank you all very much indeed. Amen. And it's great to see you back, Brian and Margaret. Thank you. Okay, um, well a couple of notices, um, I've got uh, minor things, I'm thinking about the last few weeks um, and uh, referring to the creche uh, space that we've got there, um, we are so blessed to have three ladies who regularly worship with us who uh, have very young children who breastfeed and also various other young children and uh, I've noticed uh, and one or two others of us have that some of the older children that, are in, that go to Sunday Club have been in and out of there um, we would ask, and um, I'm talking to myself as Zach's parent as well, um, that uh, the children stay in here, the children that are in Sunday Club, until they go to Sunday Club. Uh, that gives it, makes it a little quieter for those who are using the creche. Um, we've seen some door banging and whatever, and I'm ever so worried that some little fingers are going to get hurt and things. So uh, please can we ensure that we're in here, and then the children get to see the children's talk and the video and everything, and that it's much more uh, peaceful for those who are in the creche. And when children are in the creche, um, they need to be supervised by uh, their own parents as well. And a second uh, thing, uh, we've been talking about the importance of Bible reading and prayer, 
And some of you do um, uh, do this, uh, have some daily Barber reader notes, but if you don't, can I encourage you to get some? And Margaret does um, supply them uh, from, uh, for a small charge. Uh, she gets them locally from Christian Bookshop. She'll be able to help you. And also, there are um, some uh, called Our Daily Bread, and I've got some introductory copies here that you can take away for free. It's just five days' worth. Um, and then a form you fill in at the back and they'll send you send them to you to your home address and these ones are free and um, th these are free and also they are free to be sent to your home address and they are uh, a real blessing they've been a blessing to me over the years and I'm sure they will be to you so I invite you after the service if you're interested please do come and take one and if you anybody you know might be able to benefit from that please do pass that on they do them in large uh, writing as well so uh, we're going to uh, take up our offering now. That in itself is an act of worship. So as we do that, we're going to sing the song, I Raise a Hallelujah. Thank you. 
prayer now. And um, would somebody be able to get me a glass of water, please? Thank you ever so much. Somebody, I volunteer, thank you. Cheers, because if I don't have it, I'll need it, if you know what I mean. And uh, we're going to bring our prayers and intercessions before the Lord now. Lord, we thank you that you so graciously answer so many prayers that we pray. We don't always understand the reason for the answers that we receive. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's not yet. But Lord, we are commanded to pray. We're commanded to pray for all in authority. So we pray for this land where we live, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Pray for the government and His Majesty the King and the Prime Minister. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to live in freedom and uh, we are able to um, worship freely. And yet, Lord, we uh, are grieved with so much that we see that is wrong in our society. And as we so often do, Lord, we cry out for a move of your Spirit in revival. We pray, Lord, that the Spirit might come to our land. Indeed, Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit might come in revival to the whole of Western Europe. We thank you, Lord, that in other places in our world, your world, uh, you are moving in mighty power, and the kingdom of God is increasing, but the tide seems to have gone out in the West on Christendom. Lord, have mercy upon our country here, we ask. We pray, Lord, that this move of the Spirit might result in many becoming Christians, and that as a result, this uh, seasoning, this salt and uh, light in society, that we may see such improvements as, as we desire in our nation. For the next generation to grow up knowing your word. For there to be social and racial justice. For there to be the alleviation of poverty and greed may disappear. For there to be a reduction in crime rate and for there to be competence and accountability in all public services. These are just a few of the things, Lord, we pray for our land. And what we pray for our land, the United Kingdom, we also pray for all countries which are represented in the Church Fellowship. Thanking you, Lord, that you are a God who transcends all boundaries <coughs> and barriers. We pray for ourselves as Christians, called to live, as Peter tells us, in exile, strangers in a strange land. And this world is not our home. We are just passing through, and yet, Lord, you call us to live here just now. Help us, Lord, we ask. I pray that the uh, power of your Holy Spirit will be with us as we seek to live the Christian life. That you will help us to be disciplined in prayer and reading your word, to fellowship with one another, and uh, as we come before you week by week, that we might be touched. We pray that you'll help us to overcome the besetting sins that each one of us uh, probably has, but in different ways, in different areas. That we might make progress in life's journey, not just in life, but in the spiritual life as well. We pray, Lord, for our sanctification, that we might become more like the Lord Jesus. And, dear Lord, we know that you will answer this prayer because it is your will for us to be more like Jesus, and you answer according to your will. We pray for those in uh, the fellowship who are unwell at this time. We pray for your healing for them. We pray for those who are going through difficult times, that you will strengthen them and lift them up, particularly those who have been recently bereaved. And we pray for this area where you have placed us, where you have uh, placed this church, this area around here, Lord, we pray that we might see a move of your spirit, that you would uh, grant salvation to many, that you'll bless those who live in the streets and houses round about here, that they might come into this or indeed to another place of worship and find the Lord Jesus as their own personal saviour and help us, Lord, to do our part, our part in that, Lord. Bless, we pray, the distribution of the Good News newspapers, the distribution of the Easter leaflets yet to come in the next few weeks. Lord, that we might be able to share this message of the gospel in so many different ways. We pray that you'll help us to do so in our working lives, in our day-to-day -day lives, in our family lives, 
We know that you commanded us, Lord Jesus, and said, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature or all creation. Lord, show, show us what this means for us, we ask today, in 2023, at Broadbury Baptist Church and in our own personal lives. We pray for the international situation. We pray once again for the situation in Turkey and Syria with the earthquake. O oh Lord, grant, we pray, relief in these situations. And strengthen your people and agencies known to us that work there. We pray in the last week, there's been the anniversary of the uh, war in Ukraine. Lord, again, once again, we call out to you and ask that you will help this nation, this uh, benighted nation. Lord, we ask that you will uh, reverse this situation. We pray for peace. We pray for peace. We pray for healing. We pray for deliverance, Lord, from situations. And we pray for your people, of whom there are many in Ukraine, that you'll bless them and strengthen them and teach them what uh, you are teaching them in these days through this time. And now, Lord, as we come to look at this passage of your word together, we thank you for this first letter of Peter. We thank you, Lord, for uh, your word which lives, which uh, is always relevant for us. And we ask that this passage might live for us today, here in uh, our church today. That you will grant the anointing of your spirit for me and the people who are listening and watching. So that, Lord, this is something where you speak to us powerfully and we are moved and changed. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. Amen. Well, if you'd like to turn back. To that passage of scripture, 1 Peter 5 verses 1, 2, 4, just four verses today, I've entitled the message, Leadership in Trying Times, Leadership in Trying Times, and I begin with a quote from uh, Nigel Wright, who uh, used to be, he's retired now, he used to be principal of Spurgeon's College, and he said, leadership is about creating the conditions in which other people can thrive. Because in our passage today, Peter is talking about leadership. Baptist churches believe that they follow the Bible's pattern on leadership, church leadership. There are two roles, if you want. We call them deacons and elders. Elders are sometimes called pastors, bishops, overseers, whatever. But Peter is speaking this morning, particularly in a passage we're looking at, about elders. But this whole subject, you see, we've got to 1 Peter 5, this whole subject has come up providentially. I don't. I do plan things, as you know, but I don't always plan things uh, in quite the way you may think. But I, this has come up providentially because in a few weeks' time we're going to be electing deacons and elders in this church. We're going to be having elections for church leaders, in other words. So what we're looking at this morning has real relevance for us as we think and pray about these things and in the last week church members will have had and a couple of emails about this and these matter. I also believe it has a general application to all leadership and I know some of you are in responsible leadership positions in your place of work and some of you have leadership in other organisations as well and so I hope that you find this helpful. Now, we were talking a few weeks ago, weren't we, dear friends, about spiritual gifts and serving in the church. And a number of you spoke to me after that service, and uh, we are uh, to, to that, uh, just to say about that, I've um, got a couple of booklets, so I'm going to be um, copying for you about how to find out your spiritual gifts. Those that you spoke to me, I'll give those to you in the next few weeks. And then when we finish 1 Peter and after Easter, we may well, uh, in fact, I probably will do a service or two, a message or two on spiritual gifts and what that means and how we can be released into our gifts, because that is my, as we have any pastors, good pastors, heart, that people are released into their gifts. But a church may have any number of individuals, might not it? Different gifts, gifted by God in various ways, but it will still need leaders, won't it? Responsible for making decisions, providing encouragement, keeping people on the right track, the right path. 
So we're in 1 Peter, coming towards the end, we're in the final passage, final chapter of 1 Peter, and he's been speaking about times of persecution and difficulty that, that, are, come, that are going to come, and these times demands that God's people have adequate spiritual leadership. Remember I said at 4.17, or Peter said it's time for judgment to begin at God's house, and it better be in order, hasn't it, if that's the case, or to fall apart, and that really is what leadership is about. This explains why Peter wrote these verses, because like, they are a special message to leaders in the church, to leaders within the church, and to encourage them to do the work faithfully. You see, Peter was concerned, really quite concerned, I think, that uh, the leadership in the local churches be at its best, be at its very best. The reason for that largely is because uh, when the fiery trial comes, the believers in the churches should need to look to their leaders for encouragement and for direction and for uh, guidance. Peter wanted the leaders to have a vital relationship, uh, personal experience with Christ, a loving concern for God's sheep and a desire to please Jesus alone. And if you remember nothing else from today, remember that Christian leaders have to have those things. A personal experience with Jesus the Saviour, a loving concern for God's people, and a desire to please Jesus alone. Peter was asking himself, what kind of leaders are needed in the church at this time? Well, what do those leaders need to know if they're going to exercise faithful leadership during this uh, time of refining judgment? And these things, I cannot emphasise enough, are still relevant for us, because we are still strangers, in a strange land, remember the people Peter was writing to, for those of you that weren't here at the beginning of the series, uh, are exiles, refugees, immigrants. They've been thrust out of the land where they were, so most of them were in the Roman area, put out into modern day Turkey, Asia Minor, because of difficulties, and they were a little bit lost, actually. They were a little bit lost. And Peter uses this metaphor to say that they are not only strangers in a strange land, uh, physically speaking, but spiritually speaking. Christians are pilgrims. We are passing through. We are strangers in a strange land. And the whole letter is written to minister to people in that situation. And I remember I said to you at the beginning that many of us here are not in our own land of our birth. And Christians, we are not at home here in the world in the same way. And so, as long as the church remains in this world, strangers in a strange land, as long as she continues in the fragility of this exile situation, she will need faithful leaders. And good leaders are essential in the church. They care for the people and coordinate uh, things and, and all from the right motives, ideally, anyway. And as we'll see in a little while, there is an amazing incentive note, a reward, a reward for serving in this way. So does that mean that those of you that are not leaders and never want to be leaders can switch off at this point? No. No, definitely not. The whole church should be concerned about leadership because the impact of leaders on the church for better or for worse. Guidelines about the choice of leaders and how to pray for them are concerns for everyone whether you're a church member or not. Leaders are important in any community and organisation. We all know that. And good leadership can transform a church and bring fulfilment to God's people. On the other hand, poor church leadership, just like any organisation, can stifle the life and kill the vitality of a community. Now we're going to look at three principles about leadership which we can see in our verses uh, very simply, I hope. But just want to uh, draw your attention to a couple of uh, phrases. One in verse 1, Peter says, um, as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings. Now look at Peter's humble attitude. So different to the sort of person he used to be. Remember Peter in the Gospels? I'll never forsake you, Lord. Who's going to be first? He used to be arrogant. He used to be impulsive. He used to be vaunting. But now he's been tempered and changed by failure and defeat and truth and experience. And he is a different character. A completely different character. He could have said, as the leader of the twelve disciples, he could have said, as an apostle, as the chief of the apostles. But no, he says, I'm just a fellow elder with you like you. He is alongside them. He doesn't pull rank. 
Good leaders don't need a full rank. Good leaders have allowed tough times and experiences to refine their character. They have grown in humility. They still do lead from the front, hopefully, but in a certain way. So he says, fellow elder and witness of Christ's sufferings, and then verse 2, be shepherds of God's flock. And don't think that's just for pastors. The image of shepherd is rich, incredibly rich. Found throughout the Bible, we all know Psalm 23, don't we? It's in Psalm 80, Ezekiel 34, John 10. And yes, it is literally the word pastor there, but it's referring to elders, the, the, the context, but it's a good metaphor for all leadership, especially in the church, the responsibilities of protecting, leading, nurture, sustenance, providing of care. And there are two, two characteristics of shepherds in that culture, in the Middle East, ancient Near East, in the Middle East, that are relevant for church leaders today. And the first one is, the shepherd tended to know the sheep by name. He had personal care of them. It wasn't an impersonal list or a number, an impersonal number. It was personal. And secondly, the shepherd did not tend, in that culture, to be the owner of the flock. They tended to be somebody employed to look after the flock as an under-shepherd, is the phrase. Church leaders too. Jesus is the chief shepherd. It's not our flock, but God's. Now we're going to turn now to those three principles of leadership that I spoke to you about, and I think they can be seen in verses uh, 2 to 4. The first one, uh, leadership in time times, the first one is lead for the right reason. Lead for the right reason. These principles, by the way, kind of come out of the passage uh, where Peter describes them in a negative and a positive form, um, as so often in life. Uh, we see how something should be done by it being described what, what shouldn't be done. Seeing something done not well, we know how it should be done, don't we? And we see good practice where we learn about the dangers or seems to be avoided. And I, I think Peter is warning about three vices or pitfalls of Christian leadership. And uh, the first one we see is, so the first one, need for the right reason. And NIV says, not because you must, but because you are willing. Not because you have to, our version says. Instead, do it because you want to. Leaders should lead for the right reason or in the right spirit, not because they feel they must, but because they do it voluntarily. Freely choose to do it. See, this is the danger of feeling a wrong kind of obligation, and some of us are more vulnerable to that than others. I kind of, well, I do it because I have to, really. God's people have got to be wary of this. And we've all got to be wary of pressing on people into positions of leadership or volunteering. Volunteers, by definition, are not press gangs. Volunteers should not emerge simply because somebody's got to do the job. I think of the words of Judges, chapter 5 and verse 2. It's the Song of Deborah. Not that particularly well known, but Judges 5, verse 2 says this When the princes in Israel take the lead, and when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Notice that both. When the leaders lead and when the willing offer themselves, praise the Lord. And you need both. The chief shepherd is not looking for grudging conscripts, but willing volunteers. It doesn't really help anyone, does it, if we fall into the pit of begrudging service. If you, duty is good. Duty is a virtue, a sense of duty. Yes. But if that's the only thing you've got, then it won't give you the love necessary to help people flourish. And that won't please God. The fact that you lead or volunteer for a task, let's say, should not uh, be uh, done simply because uh, it is something that you feel you have to do. This sort of attitude can be avoided by cultivating what we would call a willing spirit. You know how it says in the scriptures that God loves a willing, that God loves a cheerful giver. Well, God loves a cheerful servant or a willing leader as well. We have to realise that we do these things for God, as unto the Lord. That should be the motivation of our hearts. Rather than being forced to be faithful, because we are truly privileged to serve the Lord in any way, in the whether it's the church or some other sphere. And so we must be diligent. We've got to be diligent rather than lazy, passionate about it. And that, my friends, if you've got a dead-end job, that is how to get through it. 
I'm going to speak to someone who did have a dead end job several years, uh, stuck in jail, was in a disguise suit at school. And uh, I was uh, spoken to by a poet. Now, I don't often quote poetry because it would come across a bit pretentious. Um, but this is a good one, it's George Herbert, 1633, The Elixir. It was, a, it is sometimes a hint. Teach me, my God and King, in all things thee to see, in what I do, in anything, to do it as for thee. All may of thee partake, nothing can be so mean, which with this tincture for thy sake will not go bright and clean. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divine, who sweeps the rumours for thy laws, make that and the action fine. What he's saying is, and I, I, in my first job I found this, do the, the task as for God, as unto the Lord. That is how to uh, devote your life to God, consecrate your life to God. Not just ministry, but anything. That sanctifies even the dead end job that you have. To lead for the right reason. Number two, lead with the right motive. Don't we all have mixed motives sometimes? NIV says, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Or our version has, don't do it because you want to get money, in dishonest ways. Leaders are to serve with the right motive, not for material gain, but for the sheer delight of doing it. In other words, finding satisfaction in the job itself, rather than what they get out of it. The temptation to be motivated by money or material benefits is as great today as it always was in the Christian church. There will always be certain types of theology or church structure that facilitate that, I'm afraid. But that's one of the reasons the verse is in there. The antidote to this is to serve from a zealous heart, with eagerness, as opposed to selfishly, with greed. Remember, I spoke about the zeal before. Zeal uh, and fervour for the Lord is something, uh, coupled with knowledge, is something that God uses. We are not to be apathetic, we are to be zealous, and we are to develop an enthusiasm for the work itself, not what it brings us. Making money not to be the main motive, you see. But it's a question, I mean, we all want to live, haven't we? But it's a question of where, where the motive and the heart should be, and the heart and the motive should not be for money. Particularly in Christian service, to do it for money and personal gain, is actually a prostitution of the calling of the Lord. And so you have to die against it, don't you? To enter any kind of ministry, especially pastoral ministry, and I've seen this over the years, simply because it offers a respectable and an intelligent, intellectually stimulating way of gaining a livelihood, is to prostitute that sacred work. You get to the stage where people are only doing it for their own glory or for their pensions, or whatever. And so, there is no blessing upon the ministry. It's the same as temp the temptation for any minister or any church leader to use the, the, this position to gain personal popularity or social influence. It's not wrong to want people to like you, but if you, the problem is, um, ba basically, uh, I'll come to this, but power does corrupt. You know, and if you, uh, any leader, uh, and they taught us this at college, but it's still some that didn't go in, I don't think. Um, but, uh, you know, any leader up the front, the danger is there, you, you know, you, you inflate your ego. And, and it, you become, you believe your own publicity. Um, and you say it does something to you. So we have to guard against that. We do have to guard against that. To lead for the right motive, thirdly, lead in the right manner. Verse 3, not lording it over those who trust it in you, but being examples. Or our version in the few has, don't act as if you were a ruler under those laws under your care. That hints at what we sometimes see in church that I have alluded to, misuse of power. It's referring to leaders who are domineering, but she must be led, you see, not driven. Ancient Near Eastern shepherds would walk and the sheep would follow. You wouldn't follow people to go behind with a whip. Because of human sinful nature, especially pride, this is a danger. Uh, Lord Acton said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. But of course, we shouldn't see this in church. And I have to say, dear friends, our Baptist way of doing things, our Baptist structures, when it's done well, should prevent this. Should prevent this if done properly, but it's not always the case. And we see hanging and hankering after power in the world, don't we? In everyday life, people 
butt and push and push themselves forward to get to the top by being domineering or pushing. Get to the top of the pecking order. Lording over people, though, that's not to be found in the church because there's only one Lord in the church, Jesus. Leadership is not dictatorship. There should be no force or manipulation on behalf of Christian leaders. And, oh, it's a danger, we've all done it. I've done it through preaching and other means as well. And it's always something to be guarded against. And what's the antidote? The antidote is to lead by giving an example of godly living that others can follow rather than driving forward with authoritative commands. Christians will more gladly follow somebody whose own lifestyle is an attractive example rather than somebody who shuts it down their throats. Or at least that's what I found. The church needs leaders who serve and servants who lead. I'll say that again. The church needs leaders who serve and servants who lead. That's the balance, you see. Everyone in any leadership position in the church, pastor, elder, deacon, and anything else, because there are other types of leadership in this church and in other churches. Anyone with any leadership position in the church has to have a life worthy of imitation. Not be perfect, not be absolutely perfect, but a life, that, an exemplary life. That's a major part of the role, challenging though it may be. You may feel, well, I'm not particularly gifted in it, you know, but, but it, it's your character that God is interested in. You do not have to be perfect. But this danger can be averted by recognising one's proper position in becoming models for others. So we've said those three points, good back to sermon, three points, etc. But there is more, because I'd like you just to look finally at verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, that's Jesus and his second coming, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Peter seems to be saying that there are rewards for serving the Lord. Well, we have to look for a reward. Well, we may not think we do, but we are human and we have mixed motives. And so God does graciously offer us rewards. You know, it might not be a gold watch for long service, you know, but it, God does offer us and promise us rewards. Jesus said, did he? Yes, he did. Mark chapter 10, verse 29. This is what Jesus said. Truly I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age, along with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. <coughs> You may hear Christians say, well, my reward is in heaven. Well, yes, but it does say that there is a certain reward in this life as well. We don't do it for rewards. Of course we don't. But God is gracious and kind and generous, and he knows our sinful natures, and some of us have mixed or muddy motives, so he gives us incentives to spur us on. I know uh, that the word there is crown. <coughs> that interested me because um, obviously we've got the crown in the coronation of the king coming out, haven't we? Do we really want a crown of our own? Well, you see, what incentives will encourage people to be leaders in the church? To lead gladly and well, people use this example of an award given to athletes in Greek and Roman times because they would give them a crown. The winner was crowned with a wreath of laurel leaves. They tried to make them out of the amaranth flower leaves that lasted a long time, probably our equivalent of dried flowers today. But even dried flowers, whether it's the amaranth and the flower of those times or those, even that doesn't last forever. They fade eventually. But the crown of glory that we'll be crowned with when we serve Jesus faithfully will never fade away. And so leaders have to live with a proper awareness that they serve the chief shepherd, Jesus, whom, to whom they are answerable. I think sometimes people forget that we are answerable. And he will reward services rendered with rewards in this life and rewards that are returned. You see, we are turned in our service. 
the coming of Christ and what's going to happen in future days. So everything in the local church rises or falls with leadership. Roy Searle, the ex-president of the Baptist Union, said to us at college that the first task of leadership is to define the nature of reality. And that sometimes means saying things that aren't particularly popular or pleasant. Not always. But we have to define the nature of reality. To call things as they are. But no matter how large or small a fellowship might be, the leaders, remember what I said at the beginning, the leaders must be Christians with a vital personal relationship with the Lord. A loving concern for the people and a real desire to serve and please Jesus. So then, we're going to wind up in a moment, sing a couple of songs, and then have tea and coffee. But where the rubber hits the road is this. How can you play your part in helping your leaders be all that God has intended them to be? How can you support and pray for them? Because believe you me, we do need support and pray. Is God calling you to stand as a deacon? Is God calling you to do any of the other jobs that we often advertise? And uh, I'm not going to give a list now because I'm yet to leave something out. But there are lots of other things that have been mentioned in the last few weeks. Is God calling you in that way? My advice would be don't do a Jonah. Don't run in the opposite direction because it doesn't end well. It doesn't end well. Maybe God is calling you and you are the one that God's calling you. But don't run in the opposite direction like Jonah because you can't escape from God. But seek God and he will give you the willingness and the desire to do the job. How can each one of us play our part? Because one person, one man, or even eight deacons and one of the pastor cannot do it all. It requires all of us to be involved and play our part for the church to thrive, for people to be released in their gifts, for the church to grow. Don't we want people here to come in? We do care if they come or not, don't we? We want them to come in. We're going to need more people then to help with uh, discipling, for example, the people that do come in. We're going to need more people on the prayer team. We've already mentioned teas and coffees and other things. We're going to need help. We're going to need uh, musicians. We're going to need other things. How is God calling you to pray for things? How is God calling you to serve? Amen. I'm going to sing a couple of songs now. You Never Let Go by Matt Redman and then Who Shall I Fear and Tina Hughes. Then we're going to close in prayer.
Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. 